Hi, everyone. Hi. Good morning. Morning. So, morning. As everyone streams in, um, maybe I will just jump into the introduction. Um, still streaming in. Um, it's a real pleasure to invite, uh, um, to have um, Legacy Russell and Zoe Leonard with us and a growing uh, number, steadily growing number of, uh, of attendees in this strange new world of, of Zoom. Um, I am uh, Brian Conwood. I am the Director of Research at the MA Curatorial Practice Program. Uh, at SVA, and uh, this is our second uh, event in our fall series of, uh, of completely online uh, Zoom events. I uh, hope you can also join us for our others. On October 23rd, we will have uh, Richard Burkett and Mason Labor Yap uh, uh, talking about um, their friendship and, and, uh, and long collaboration in, in, in relation to what we might call uh, like a, a, a withdrawing or shrinking uh, art world. Um, on November 4th, uh, we have Nikita Intian Tai and Jen Ru Wu from the Guangdong Times Museum in uh, Guangzhou, who will be speaking about uh, their new publication uh, at the museum and also uh, the attempt to think uh, beyond the exhibition. Um, which they are starting to do at Times Museum in Guangzhou. And then uh, on December 11th, uh, we will have uh, chair of the program, Stephen Henry Madoff, uh, speaking with Celine Condorelli, Christina Newman Scott, and Shuda Bratta Sengupta from Rax Media Collective on the politics of friendship. Um, so, by way of uh, formalities, uh, I would ask that everyone please uh, stay on mute and ask your questions. Well, I guess, you know, no one can stop you from asking questions in the chat during the conversation. Go for it. Um, uh, Legacy uh, will we'll, we'll keep an eye or, or half an eye or a quarter of an eye on the, on the chat and maybe they will, they will make their way, maybe your questions will make, your way, make their way into the discussion, uh, depending on how their discussion is going. And afterwards, uh, after the discussion, we only have an hour, so of course time is quite tight. But we will uh, we will try to get to some of them uh, at the uh, at the very end. Um, what else? Um, this meeting is being recorded, so um, this is important to know. We will probably maybe uh, uh, post it afterwards for those who have been asking also about the recording. Um, also, um, our guests should know that you will, if you, your mic is off for one reason or another, you will very likely end up uh, uh, sealed into the recording forever. So you, you may be recorded, um, you should be aware of that. And uh, what else? Um, I think the only thing is, oh right, uh, Verso Books has given us a nice 50% off uh, discount code for Glitch Feminism. Um, I'm still admitting people uh, into the meeting. Uh, a nice 50% off discount code, uh, but they have also alerted us to the fact that the book uh, is uh, being reprinted. So must, maybe a second printing is happening, yeah. already, which is really great. <laughs> like um, so uh, I will post this discount code. I will post the discount code in the chat. Um, go for it, but uh, you may not be able to order the book immediately, but you should. Uh, eventually. Um, okay, so those are the formalities. By way of introduction, uh, thank you so much, Legacy and Zoe, for 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 agreeing to to be here with us. Also, with your with your very busy uh, schedules. Um, by way of introduction, uh, Zoe Leonard is a New York-based artist who balances rigorous conceptualism with a distant with a distinctly personal vision in her work, which merges photography, sculpture, and installation. By employing strategies of repetition, shifting perspectives, and a multitude of printing processes, Leonard's practice probes the politics of, of representation and display. Leonard explores themes such as gender and sexuality, loss and mourning, migration, displacement, and the urban landscape 
and her photography specifically invites us to contemplate the role that the medium plays in constructing history and to consider the roots of contemporary phot photographic culture. More than its focus on any particular subject, however, Leonard's work encourages the viewer to reconsider the act of looking itself, drawing attention to observation as a complex ongoing process. And uh, Legacy Russell is a curator and writer born and raised in New York City. She's the associate curator of exhibitions at the Studio Museum in Harlem. As the founding theorist of glitch feminism, her academic, curatorial, and creative work focuses on gender, performance, digital selfdom, internet idolatry, and new media ritual. Russell's written work, interviews, and essays have been published internationally. She is the recipient of the Toma Foundation 2019 Arts Writing Award in Digital Art and a 2020 Rauschenberg Residency Fellow. Her first book is Glitch Feminism, a manifesto published this year and by Verso uh, Books. And it's my great pleasure to, to turn it over to Legacy and Zoe. Thank you, Brian, um, and thank you, SBA, for Zoe and I. I will say, um, to start the conversation, Zoe, I'm like really nervous. <laughs> <laughs> I just have to, I think it's like really, um, I keep having like an out of body moment of just being like, oh my gosh, like Zoe Leonard, this person I have so admired and just appreciated. Um, you know, I, I'm thinking of, you know, when I asked you to do this and, um, you know, your response of thinking about, you know, why is it that um, this might be something that I would want, um, given your kind of commitment to the analog, I think is how you put it. Um, and I just kind of felt like that there is so much actually that is shared across parts of how you think. Um, and what the manifesto um, aspires to do. And of course, um, given the work of, of um, I Want to Dyke for President in particular, for me, that kind of has operated as such an important manifesto. Um, so, you know, I feel very honored to be here with you today and also, you know, to be continuing in a conversation, which to be honest, you know, in terms of your work more broadly has kind of been um, playing in my head over seeing your work out in the world. Mm. Uh, legacy. That's. I was so happy to get the invitation, and um, I just I want to start by just saying congratulations to you on this huge achievement and this beautiful book, which I've been really loving reading. Check out all the post its. I love the post its. Oh yeah, no, and this is my analog world right here. Legacy. I'm putting a post it on the page, like. Um, but congratulations, it's an incredible achievement. And it's amazing that it's already sold out and is in a second printing like that. And as it should be, it's utterly, um, it's appropriate and it's um, timely. And uh, it's been a really great read. And um, and yeah, the, the more, um, it was really interesting, like reading your book has been incredibly fascinating for me because there are so many um, points at which I think our work intersect and um, where our goals are held in common. And then I was also really aware of this kind of generational disposition. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The term I somehow came up with that, um, that by virtue of being two, of, from two different generations, we're sitting in different position to certain questions. And mm -hmm. um, so I'm actually especially grateful for that because um, it's, I inherited a certain idea of feminism from the generation before me. And it's also, um, it's good to also be educated by the generation after me. Like I, th I think that intergenerational learning is, um, and teaching and uh, sort of opening each other's eyes is as important as any other kind of intersectionality um, mm -hmm. because these issues hopefully evolve, right? And our attitude towards different things evolves. So um, I'm really happy to be here. Yeah, I, I mean, I think like kind of um, where those things intersect and as well where they diverge or as well maybe informally feels um, maybe like a really necessary place that just I mean, um, also reflecting through um, kind of themes of your work, right? Like learning this question of migration um, these are kind of uh, materials that travel through glitch feminism as well, uh, um, you know, of the kind of memoir 
development of it, which, you know, definitely reflects on a kind of loss of a certain type of place um, and then um, as the sort of East Village changed in my growing up there. Mm -hmm. um, and then as well, thinking through, you know, how to manifest a different type of space, a space that can be, um, you know, emancipatory um, and, you know, perhaps uh, empowered by a different type of imagination. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I'm curious, I guess, to kind of hear um, maybe a, a bit about your thoughts there, right? Like, you know, kind of how um, this kind of dreaming capable, um, you know, what it does to think through this particular present political moment, but also, like you said, this wider arc of a kind of intergenerational conversation where, um, you know, the presence of your work has touched many chapters of different types of, of lives um, and as well uh, political presences. Um, and that this book comes out, of course, in a very particular time where everything feels um, really disjointed and, um, you know, as well, uh, quite broken in the world. Um, and so to be talking about glitches in particular um, is a really useful and challenging vehicle to kind of drive us forward today. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, yeah, this actually, this idea of the glitch and the kind of the, the idea of the mistake as a place, as a productive place, is something that feels really central to my work as well and to my being actually in the world. Um, so this, um, this kind of flipping around of something that's supposed to be a mistake or a kind of errancy um, into a kind of, um, that the slippage is where those of us who feel we are on the margins or those of us that are in fact marginalized through dominant social and political structures, the glitch is the way we slip in, right? Like that's mm -hmm. our territory. And so finding the space between things like where you can get into that crack and just pry, pry it open um, feels really important to me and um, something I really identify with. Something that really struck me as a kind of um, a place where I was really aware of our generational difference in my disposition was like in this idea of that AFK, right? Like mm -hmm. away from away keyboard. From keyboard. Yeah. And a lot of the, all right, I'm gonna back up for a second to, to get there from a different angle. Um, one of the things that's so remarkable about the timing of your book coming out now is that, um, as well as the world feeling broken, as you just said right now, and our politics feeling really broken, and so many aspects of our society feeling broken, there's also this way that we're all living so much of our lives online right now. I mean, the fact that we're doing this not in a room together, but mm -hmm. in this other kind of room, this digital room, um, is uh, is just is notable. Um, and the way that I grew up and the feminism that I inherited had to really do with a kind of grounding in physical presence. It had to do with the body as a physical, um, a physical entity that was, um, and, and that, you know, of course is complicated, um, but, but I'm just going to gloss over that for now. There's a, a lot we could get into with that. Into it. <laughs> and, the yeah. kind of, and the kind of activism that I grew up with also or grew into in my late 20s was AIDS activism that really mm -hmm. had to do with putting our bodies in the street. And it really had to do also <clears throat> with queer bodies um, being devalued um, socially and uh, and dying as like sick and dying bodies and resistant bodies, very much as a physical presence. Like we would physically be in the street, locking arms, being dragged away by the police, um, much as Black Lives Matter activists are doing now. So thinking about mm -hmm. the body, the physical body as kind of my grounding as the default position and the online as being kind of auxiliary or secondary. And the way in your writing, you sort of flip it around where you're saying um, the body is a construction, um, the body is a metaphor, and that the online presence is the starting place. And that like the, the phrase AFK, away from keyboard, um, as opposed to IRL, as opposed to like, you make a kind of argument in one of the chapters about mm -hmm. yeah. 
you know, is sort of saying that being online is the default position. Mm -hmm. And then you carry your, the persona you develop online, you carry that into your off screen life. And I just thought, wow, that is so amazing. Um, because it kind of, in a way, it's a space of like science fiction, right? Because yeah. it's a way of saying that like who we are and how we conceive of ourselves and how we conceive of each other is grounded in a kind of consciousness, right? Yeah. More than anything else. So it's another, it's a, it's another way of thinking about double consciousness, I think. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Another way of thinking about um, the constructions of the mind and where physicality fits into that. So I was kind of, um, rather than resisting this flipping, I was like, okay, let's like, let me, let me try to go there. Let me like yeah. think about what this, um, and that led me, of course, um, there's a couple of, you know, Octavia Butler, I think, figures pretty largely in your work. Right, yeah. Um, and, and that means a lot, I think, Zoe, because thinking about this question of, like, science fiction um, and, and as well, like, different types of imaginations, I feel like Octavia Butler and Samuel Delaney and Essex Temple and Aud Audre Lorde, they're, like, doing that work in the text, um, you know, kind of holding that type of space. And, and I, I, um, I appreciate, you know, just to kind of suss out because what you've just um, shared is so rich to me and, and so generous um, in thinking about glitch feminism um, and your, as well, moment of being embodied and in the street and political, right? Like what that looks like um, and what that felt like. Um, it feels really um, incredible to be in this moment talking about the glitch um, in a moment too, where a lot of the um, kind of language of that period um, in terms of AIDS activism has been resurrected to talk about COVID-19 um, and to think about what it means to be embodied in a moment where there's a pandemic, right? What collective sickness looks like, right? And how that is being both stigmatized and grappled with and problematized in different ways, but embodied um, and who is doing that embodiment, who's kind of carrying that as a kind of labor and economy feels really curious um, and difficult. Um, and at points like really violent, of course, too, because, you know, they're not the same. And, um, and, how, and how that language has operated, right, feels at points um, really convenient. Um, but, you know, as well, it, I think the nuanced read of it feels necessary, um, most particularly as we see, you know, how these things are, of course, being um, sort of more manipulated, perhaps, in, in a broader political discourse. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm interested in that. And then I also am interested in, in you know, your um, speaking to this question of, like, what it is to be um, embodied and on the internet, because, you know, I do think the part of the read of AFK, which is away from keyboard, um, for those who are new to the term, and it's something that um, a theorist, Nathan Jurgensen, um, began writing about, um, you know, in the kind of early aughts. But, um, you know, AFK as a kind of binary to IRL um, just takes a different position on what is considered real. Um, and I That's think, too, right. imbues a different type of responsibility to this idea of being on the internet, which, you know, at one point was this question of a kind of emancipatory anonymous space where, um, you know, all things would have the potential to be very utopic which of course we know is not real. Um, but you know, recognizing that the problems of the world and the problems of the internet actually go hand in hand, thinking about the selves that yeah. we cultivate and you know, exist within and expand um, online. Um, and for people who, you know, which is where the book starts, like for kids coming of age on the internet um, and trying to navigate who they were, like, who were we? We were you know, online and we were in chat rooms and we were doing, you know, naughty things like and pretending to be different types of people and that that actually as a narrative allowed for a different type of being when we left our screens mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. can you can you actually say a little bit more about that like about yeah. about growing up because the other um like in your introduction and then in our our conversation the other day we were talking a little bit about how you grew up and uh, growing up in the east village and um growing up in a kind of non-traditional family structure. And so I'm really curious, can you tell a little bit more about like the, the um, your experience of coming of age online and also how that, um, how that was intercut with your experiences in the neighborhood and on the street and in kind of downtown counterculture? Yeah, I mean, I think, 
it's kind of funny. I feel like that I um, learned a lot about kind of what a, a queer model of family making was before I even knew what that was from my family model. Um, you know, I grew up in the East Village. I grew up, um, you know, in downtown New York. And um, what that was, was, you know, growing up in a studio apartment in one room with my mom and my dad. And then at some point, my mom and dad split up and my dad moved upstairs. Um, and my mom stayed downstairs. And that was, you know, probably when I was six years old or so. And then for the next, you know, 20 plus years, they lived exactly that. Um, and, you know, our family model was very much so shaped by having this community where I think all, you know, friends would come, um, you know, family members, et cetera, and kind of travel between these two different spaces. Um, but as well that like existing with people who, you know, I was growing up with, you know, going to school downtown and um, as well working downtown. One of my first jobs um, was working um, at B Bar and Grill for the Gay Party Beige. Um, and so that was a kind of early touch point for uh, my coming to a better understanding of really what um, performance was. I think that was, those were the first moments where I, you know, I remember meeting Sandra Bernhardt there. I remember meeting, um, you know, Michael Musto and, and Sophia Lamar and, and, you know, getting a sense too of like how those things um, could be out in the world. And, and um, you know, it was like being 15 and working in this bar space and, um, you know, hanging out downtown and, and doing like the naughty things that teens do where you, you know, lie and then say that you're going to a party and perhaps you know <laughs> you're, around the, you're around the corner from your own house on a rooftop you know somewhere um smoking cigarettes and drinking 40s like that kind of um experience of being in downtown new york was like very much um <laughs> fundamental to that like it was like yeah. a necessary rebellion right um yeah. but i think too like it it allowed me to see like where nightlife um maybe was originally embedded and where performance was embedded too like you know Tompkins square park at that time had the charlie parker jazz festival it had wigstock um it had hal which was the Ginsburg Festival. Um, mm -hmm. These were, you know, I grew up around the corner from the Poetry Project and Dance Space. Um, and that was where I remember first seeing like Patti Smith perform, for example. So, you know, these were like these crazy moments where I, I just felt um, so um, immersed in, in what this material was as a kind of art form. But it really actually was not something that I saw as being kind of part of the art world. Right, um, right. These were the glitches. Um, and these were the individuals who kind of, you know, when I think of how to kind of formulate the language of the, the manifesto, I I think that I learned from that, that place and that position, the way that those things existed um, in the world, in bars and in clubs, um, you know, in uh, church spaces, um, you know, that were kind of transformed toward performative means um, in parks and allowing that to become part of kind of how I began to think about the ways that art um, could move really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think, um, yeah, I had, I mean, different, but, um, again, generationally, but um, I, we lived in um, Harlem when I was a kid. So I went to public school and then I um, got like a scholarship and went to like fancy private school for like two years and then dropped out and spent like one year going to this place called City As School, which mm -hmm. is kind of like a glitch school. Like mm -hmm. ultimately it was like for all the kids that were like, kind of had trouble with authority, didn't really fit into like a normally structured school. And so we also all kind of found each other there. Mm -hmm. So I ended up like running at like age, I guess like 15, 16, running with this little crew of complete wild children. Um, I got an apartment on 6th Street between A and B. It was I like- I grew up on 8th Street between 2nd and 3rd. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> I know when I read that. We're like also, running alongside of each other somehow. <laughs> totally. Like in time and space. Yeah, right? exactly. Totally. exactly. No, but like a, the same stomping grounds and like the, this kind of like, for me, it was also really finding this, um, finding like a space where that made sense to me, actually, because all the other stuff didn't make sense to me, like heteronormative kind of like suburban culture or people that had like two parents and like jobs and money and like a television and like none of that was part of my experience. Um, yeah. And when I found this, I, I think in a way I first found like myself through the books I was reading and like as a, as like a, um, really like in grade school and then like as a tween mm. you know I started reading 
um, like reading Sartre and reading Camus and kind of being like, oh my God, there's this thing called existentialism. I was like, oh, okay. Like, and I just immediately was like, oh, so I can be like, if this, if other people are thinking this and having this experience, it gives me space to be. Mm. And then when I was 15, um, this friend of my brother's brought over Patti Smith's horses the day mm -hmm. it was released. Um, and the friend was this guy, Brian Butterick, who was like lovers with David Wanarovich and like later in Three Teens Kill Four. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know Brian that well, but he was my brother's friend. And he brought home this like Patti Smith album and it was, and they were playing it. And I was like, I kind of hated it, but I kind of loved it. And then when they went out, I like let myself into my brother's room and I just played it all night long. I was like, I played it and I loved it. I played it and I hated it. Um, and I would like look at the at the, the front of the album, the photograph, it's a picture that Maplethorpe took of Patti Smith. And I was completely in love with her in this photograph and I was like, that seemed wrong. So I kept flipping the album over and looking at all the guys in the band and trying to fall in love with them. And that wasn't working. So I like flipped it over. And I was so like undone by this record that I told my best friend AC Chubb about it. And we found out that Patty was playing somewhere. And so we went to our first like Patty Smith concert together. And that brought me downtown. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and we were like, we were <laughs> like, we went to um, a thrift shop and I bought like a black jacket and a white yeah. shirt. And then I found a tie with stripes that had a little unicorn on it. And I got a like a little seam ripper and I ripped the horn off of it. So it looked like a horse. And that was like my outfit for my first Patty Smith concert. I love that. Actually, like I'm having memories of the first time that I ever was taken to CBGB's by a friend of mine. I grew up around the corner from CBGB's. Totally. Did not go there um, probably until I was like mid high school because it was so close to my house that I was like afraid to go, you know, basically basically like two blocks away from where I grew up. Right. And the first time I ever went there, um, someone punched me in the face and I fell on the floor. Oh and I remember, God. no, and this is like, this was, it was literally one of those situations where like I dropped to the floor. And then I remember I was with my friend Haley and I like stood up and um, I think everyone was really concerned, rightfully so. There was this like 90 pound girl who had just been punched. And I just was like, oh, that was awesome. Because essentially it was not like people were just dancing. Like they were dancing in the most intense way. I had no point of reference at that point of like what a mosh pit had been, you know, like did not, had never been, you know, in that kind of um, space and, and time. And like, it was this kind of interesting moment of just learning that, you know, what that, what those gestures were, right? But like these questions of being able to be like, you know, in, in that type of space, right? To like be able to dance and kind of exercise maybe some of your demons. Um, yeah. Some of yeah energy, the angst, the existential crisis, you know, all of those, those um, kind of moving feelings um, and have it be like, okay, you know, that like there was this kind of collective space for being able to kind of mosh and let it out. Um, and yes, of course, with some like, you know, gentle injuries, um, but nothing that was like <laughs> intentional, right? Like it was like one of those things that I was like, well, like in any other space, like that would have actually been like really scary. Yeah. But, you know, learning how to kind of get, make, make, take up space in that way and get yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I look back at pictures of myself from that time and I think like there are definitely photos where it looks like, you know, like a small tiger attacked me because, um, you know, I have like, I used to intentionally like rip all my clothes and, you know, like kind of everything <laughs> looked like in a state of general disarray, but I thought it was so cool. And it was the most kind of, um, Sort of offensive thing I think that one could do when thinking about this question of being respectable or respectability politics and thinking about questions of blackness and queerness um, are really complicated and I remember my dad at points even though he was like kind of a great renegade in many ways but it was surprising the moments where he would get really miffed because you know I would insist on having chip nail polish I would insist on having um, you know tears in my tights and you know jeans that actually were kind of you know in a state of, of um, 
kind of being torn and, and um, you know, stained uh, from the various things that I would go out and get into. So, you know, those things too became these kind of interesting traces and, and a meaningful way too for like myself and my friends to try to figure out a way of just like doing that kind of expression, as you said, like with your tie, um, you know, what does it, you know, look like and feel like to be um, in these spaces and trying to think about ways to um, individuate and, you know, that that as a kind of loop in existing, you know, both mm. in the world, but also so of course, like how that manifests um, in kind of finding oneself on the internet um, became really important too. Yeah, I mean, I think what you're saying is like, it was a form of resistance, which mm -hmm. is really what your book is about. It's about um, forms of resistance and about um, the, the power of refusal, right? Like I love that in this, um, the Nope Manifesto that really opens yeah, the Eugene's work. Hmm? Yeah, yeah e. Jane's piece. Work by e. Jane, yeah. Yeah, which is so, it's so great. Like, I love this. I am not asking who I am. Hmm. A Black woman and expansive in my Blackness and my queerness as Blackness and queerness are always expansive. Hmm. None of this is as simple as identity and representation outside of the colonial gaze. I reject the colonial gaze as the primary gaze. I am outside of it in the land of nope, which yeah. I think is really, um, I think like this, that talking about like these sort of formative years and finding counterculture mm -hmm. um, resonates on a lot of different levels because part of it is about shifting that primacy away from the should, right? Mm. It's resisting the structures that be on a kind of very visceral level and just saying like, no, like these structures don't actually make space for me. So it's, um, it's not just about like teenage rebellion as a kind of like, oh, that's what teens do or as some like hormonal, you know, whatever, which, well, I don't know, it's another conversation, but, um, but as this like actually profound structural shift. Mm. Um, the other thing we were talking about the other night, which I thought was interesting and part of why we, um, why we ended up sharing this sort of like stomping ground of the East Village, even though 20 years apart, um, but was this idea of there being um, kind of um, that, that, that the different, that like poetry and cinema and um, visual art and dance and all, and all of these things were colliding and all of them were available. And I found myself shifting very easily from, you would kind of roll from one thing to another and then you would just dance until five in the morning. Mm -hmm but that it wasn't this idea of them being segregated from one another. There was really an idea of porosity and movement. And I would move from, you know, be like dancing at the mud club, but then ending up in like queer leather bars, you know, like, and it didn't seem that like, they didn't seem to have um, boundaries between them, or at least that's how I experienced it. Yeah. And I think that's another really, uh, important concept that you deal with in your book is the kind of refusal of the binary and the refusal of um, these certain things having boundaries around them. Um, we were sort of talking about um, even the way so much of like the art world is constructed today mm -hmm. and even the term art world, which is a right. term that I've always really disliked. I yeah. never identified with it. And also, like, just, whose world is it? Like, is it ours? It, I don't know. You know, it gets exactly. Really like, we yeah. live in the world, and yeah. then there's art. And I'm kind of like, it's not a world by itself. The whole mm. point of art is that it's in our world with mm. it. With mm. you know that we're not to say, oh, it's this segregated space that like is only inhabited by the cultural elite. Like that to me. It just doesn't, that does not, it just doesn't work for me. Yeah. And I mean, I think like the book, I, I love that you brought up, um, you know, E. Jane's piece, but I also, you know, I have um, in front of me, Mark Aguar's piece. These are the axes from 2012. And I remember finding this on the internet, um, you know, ages ago and it just, it, it stuck with me, but it starts um, with the assumption bodies are inherently valid. Um, the second one is remember death. The third is be ugly. The fourth is no beauty. The fifth is it is complicated. The sixth is empathy. Seventh is choice. Eighth is reconstruct and reify. Ninth is respect and negotiate. And I love that, like that thinking of like what mm -hmm. the axes 
are, um, you know, in terms mm -hmm. of about this question of, of art living in the world, right? That um, what it means for um, these spaces and places to be kind of porous and permeable, like, you know, I, I agree that the um, ways that things have been, you know, kind of going into theater space and going into literary space and going into sort of um, cinema space, um, it's not always advantageous, right, to thinking about a way that these things actually, too, are kind of, um, you know, part of a kind of queer form or a, a, I would say a Black cultural form um, where actually it does live in the everyday. There is something, I think, that, um, you know, is really exceptional about that and the artists in the book speak to that, too, um, you know, yeah. recognizing their presence across a kind of queer nightlife, a Black um, you know, cultural experience as it exists, you know, as a kind of creative form and, and that those things, you know, as they've traveled onto the internet have kind of taken up a, a different type of space, but also maybe have come out of the necessity um, and the sort of maybe more somber reality that these spaces um, are kind of consistently um, being kind of um, erased and, and uh, you know, kind of disappearing actively from a physical space. And so the internet um, for my generation, I think, has been this interesting touch point because, you know, there, I saw that transition happen in East Village, you know, the, the moments where I was able to kind of have that tail end of a certain type of New York and then um, have the other version of New York, which, you know, going back to at points, I think feels really baffling because it, you know, is very much so kind of rendered yeah. um, invisible, you know, this other chapter of it, you know, CBGBs being closed, like a lot of yeah. these different places and spaces um, no longer um, housing the same type of, um, you know, movement and, and kind of collective action, um, both politically and also creatively. And that I think, you know, is, um, you know, in addition to this question too, of like the present moment where we're all kind of socially distanced, as you had said earlier, right? We're like in this form that has this um, kind of um, by necessity separation is really difficult to think about, you know, thinking about, you know, how to kind of get to a place where some of these things may take a different shape and form and, and as well to um, celebrate the histories that um, brought together such important confluence of, of folks in terms of thinking um, about what the body is and how how that can exist um, as a sort of vessel for creative work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, no, that's really beautifully said. Um, and I'm thinking that kind of brings us, you know, this idea of nightlife brings us to Boy Child that you write mm -hmm. about in the yeah. book. And then what you were talking about also brings me to this um, Sandra Perry quote in here, which is, I think maybe a, another really important idea here which is the whole, uh, the Sandra Perry quote runs as follows. The whole concept of visibility assumes that you're not in a system that wants you dead. I think a lot of people forget that many of the places we are inserted in want to kill us, mm. not supposed to be there. So yeah. I think, you know, we're kind of talking about like these really um, ecstatic moments of self-discovery where we were able to, build a world and and find connective tissue like find our kind of um galaxy or like our our kind of like our family of thinkers that we were mm. like oh this is where i belong but then there's also this reality that there is a kind of system of state control and um that and 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 many systems at play that want many of us to not be here. Right, and, absolutely. And so I think maybe we could, I don't know if you wanna, I guess there's a couple couple things I wanted to lay out there. I will say, Zoe, that like this is also part of the reason why I want to dike for president um, has always been meaningful to me. But I think especially, um, you know, noting how it has circulated almost virally on the internet, um, you know, before this moment, but I think especially in this moment, I feel like every moment that I am looking at my feed, there's always at least two or three people who have posted um, this work from, um, you know, your 1992 kind of writing. And, and um, you know, I agree with you about this question of like, you know, this, this sort of systems and the state and and uh, making the determinations about you know who has the right to live and you know that was something that um you know in the aids epidemic was a question right and the the kind of failure of the state to protect certain bodies um and do that work actively right meant that there was a decision being made about who had that right to live um and as well you know in as we're seeing in this present moment right we're seeing with george 
Floyd and Brianna Taylor and Nina Pop, like so many folks, right, who, um, you know, are part of that ongoing conversation about, um, you know, a right to live and as well, um, you know, being, uh, you know, as you know, noting with E. Jane, right, kind of in this culture that perhaps doesn't love us. And, you know, that as a reality, right, of course, is like the other side of the coin, I, you know, the ecstatic narrative of being a kid, right, and which is what the book speaks from, and thinking through, you know, how to navigate this world also brings us to these questions of safety and care, um, you know, and for me, that is um, really important, because like, these are, those are the glitches too, you know, in the, the piece, um, as I've read it over many years, right, like, these are, these are the glitches, the glitches, you know, exist, um, you know, in in terms of the, the, the folks who have, you know, as you write, um, I want someone who has been in love and been hurt, who respects sex, who has made mistakes and learned from them. I want a black woman for president. I want someone with bad teeth, someone who has eaten hospital food, someone who cross-dresses and has done drugs and been in therapy, right? Like that those actually um, speak to the kind of necessity of uh, a different type of, of presence. Um, and I like feel, deeply committed to like those glitches, right? Those actually are the errors in quote unquote, because actually, you know, as we're thinking about the system as it stands, right? That um, that system is, is um, intended to kind of snuff out um, those um, marginalized identities, those, those points of difference. Um, and, you know, the investment of, um, you know, our lives and recognizing that they actually do matter. Um, is something that you know really is a kind of bedrock of what this text intends to do. Yeah. Yeah. No. Um, I'm not. I'm not sure what to say about it, but yeah, I agree. I mean, I think um, I don't know that that is a text I would write today. Mm -hmm. um, I would probably come at it really differently. I don't know. Um, I don't know that I would look for a list of kind of demographics to mm. locate a politics. Right, right. Um, although I think um, there are a couple of things about that text that, I guess this brings us to the, also the form of manifesto, which mm -hmm. I'd love to um, you to address as well after, um, after I do. Um, and I hadn't really intended it as a manifesto, but I think, yeah, the, I'm calling it that. <laughs> yeah, no, totally. And many people do. I mean, some people yeah, call yeah. it a poem, some people call it a manifesto. Mm -hmm. It came about um, out of a whole, um, a whole kind of moment where, um, where this fear of being completely erased, it, it wasn't just an abstract fear. It was like mm -hmm. friends of mine were, were dying. And I think, you know, earlier when you brought up the pandemic and like the ways that it's mirrors what happens during the AIDS crisis and then the ways in which it's very, very different. Um, one of the key ways I think that it is similar is not in the nature of the disease itself, but in the government um, inaction mm -hmm. and the government um, misinformation and the government not responding adequately. Um, the fact that Anthony Fauci was around then and now sometimes for our generation, we're just like, oh my God, it's still yeah. Tony Fauci. Um, and, <laughs> um, and that's like a whole other conversation because I do think Tony Fauci is really sort of doing his best. Um, yeah, yeah. But but I, I, I think it's actually incredible to, to that point in particular that this, you know, Dr. Fauci as a figure, right, um, being in those two points specifically and that it is not... Um, I think a coincidence that some of the the sort of thought and response, um, the methodologies here, um, you know, do speak to each other because they, there are touch points that have you know extended across that period of time. And I think there's something really important that needs to be said, which I've said it this before, but I, you know, AIDS, the virus itself was not really the problem. The problem was the government and medical community's response to it and the amount of social stigma that didn't allow us to address it properly as a society and allowed it to become the global pandemic that it is now. Um, what I feel like we learned in the AIDS crisis is that queer people, people of color and drug users were expendable. That's the mm -hmm. message that we got from the government. Um, when I 
experiencing the US government's response, this administration's response to the COVID-19 pandemic, the message for me is even more chilling. It's basically that all of us are completely expendable. Absolutely. And that I, I think, I just didn't, I didn't think things could get any worse than they were during those early days of the AIDS epidemic. And now you're like, wow, the message is so loud and clear, just like none of you guys matter. Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, I don't, I, I'm aware of that. I take it in. I think it's an incredibly chilling message from our administration. And I still have this conviction, um, and maybe this goes to the manifesto, what, um, what I want a president does is it doesn't list, it's not a list of demands, it's a list of desires. Mm -hmm. And it's about making the space for us to be truthful about what we want and about what we need and how we want to govern ourselves, what we want our relationship to be with each other. And that that power, there's a tremendous power in our connection with each other and with our ability to be allies to one another. And maybe that's like, you know, call me crazy, call me idealistic, but I'm, I still believe in that. And that the, the alliances we can build, the conversations we can have, the work we can do together, that's where power lies there too, in a pretty profound way. Um, so, Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think that that right what you just said in terms of how you articulated it um you know in terms of this a question of it being uh idealistic in some way is like the reason why i like to think of it as a manifesto is because you know not all manifestos are necessarily idealistic right but um the structure of the manifesto people have asked often you know why a manifesto why not a different yeah. type of form? why not a history of cyber feminism for example um and you know First of all, I didn't want to write that book um, because, uh, <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I, for, my interest was to think about why it is in terms of cyber feminism in particular, um, that black and queer narratives were not um, placed more at the forefront um, of that discourse, given that black and queer people were on the internet and doing really important work um, toward that end. But also, thinking about the wider arc of like what a manifesto even does, like what is the point of it? Um, yeah. And, you know, for me, a manifesto allows you to make some really outrageous um, claims um, and like imagine in the most ambitious and at points like devastatingly um, uh, kind of ecstatic, um, you know, the, take up the most space possible. Um, and when you use the words um, demands like this, you know, the, the piece, um, you know, I wanted to make for president, you know, may not be a list of demands, but, you know, glitch feminism is in a weird way. Um, you know, it is something that, um, you know, is kind of hoping to galvanize, um, you know, not, if not the reader, but the reader and then some, right? Like how it exists out in the world when it travels beyond. And um, part of the reason too, you know, outside of just being generally a nerd um, and loving art um, that, you know, it brings art into that is because I think art and manifestos, um, art and artists, and manifestos kind of share something in that way. Artists also, you know, they're not um, hewn to the um, rules of the everyday. Um, and that I think is something that is really exciting because, you know, it can exist within this kind of realm of what feels like fantasy or uh, extreme imagination, um, kind of decadent dreaming um, and project different types of futures and maybe as well have those things like actively change shape and form over time. Um, and artists do that work and manifestos do too. Um, yeah. So it felt really like a kind of logical progression to have them sh uh, share space in that way. And for, you know, artists to be speaking through this manifesto and vice versa and to have the manifesto kind of exist as this web that you know supports artists um, in uh, celebrating their work and as well kind of you know allowing their kind of ambitions as they're envisioning these different futures mm -hmm. to stand um, you know center stage. Yeah no that's really beautiful um, thank you for that because I was going to ask you at one point when I, in the book I was like because so much of the book has to do with um, the glitch space of slippage and the sort of, you know, um, these in-between spaces and the kind of sliding and moving and mobility. And yet the form of manifesto is declarative, 
right? And mm -hmm. so the language that you're using is actually incredibly declarative and frontal in a certain way, right? right. And I was like, wow, this is kind of like a contradiction. And yeah. um, in terms of, you know, that it isn't a flowy, um, sort of syncopated poem, it's really is written as a manifesto. Yeah, and, this is why it took me literally yeah. to figure this but, out. Because like, I mean, for those who kind of like read the early essays, like it was hilarious, you know, I feel like I've written like 10 books in the midst of this one little <laughs> tiny book. It's, it's so sweet and small and it's meant to be carried with you. But like, I feel like there were so many points where I struggled exactly with that, Zoe, where it was like, how do you take something where we're talking about like, what is being slippery? Like, what does that look like to kind of exist in a kind of liminal space? How does that um, manifest in a text form? And it like everything that felt like it existed on the page felt almost too permanent um, for the subject content, right? right. Like it was like, right. it, it, something that could um, keep moving. And so, you know, after a while and like probably pissing off like my editor times a thousand, um, you know, it was like really actually great to just realize that the movement is in the artists, um, that they move. And so, you know, the, the text itself, like, you know, the things that are on the page, of course, are going to be fixed, but that their work is the thing that like, you know, continues to move in the world. Um, you know, it speaks from their position, um, allows, um, you know, their words, like as you were reading, you know, kind of um, Sandra's um, kind of thoughts about this question of what it means to exist in the world, um, you know, speaks from those places and, and, and that their mm -hmm. words are kind of um, the springboard to kind of thinking about how we can move too and, and be inspired by yeah. that. But it definitely, I mean, it was a challenging task. Um, and at a certain point, I just had to draw a line and say, like, the artists are the thing that, like, exists in the world, right? Like, the books, books will always, you know, as they become fixed um, in a moment in time, um, you know, it's really the context that's around it that changes, which I'm sure, you know, as, as you've seen with, with different chapters of your work, too, being informed by different points in history um, that have helped to kind of expand it, um, you know, and read it differently. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, no, I literally, Zoe talked to you all day. It's just such I a I know, I know. I feel like, because I feel like I haven't even, like, I took all these notes, and there's, like, we haven't even gotten through, like, a tenth of them. There are so many more things I want to ask and say. Um, I don't know. Did you want to, like, do some questions now, or what, how do you, how are you feeling? Cool questions. We've got a couple minutes. We can take some questions, but also, you know, Zoe, if there were some things you wanted to, to share, you know, as we're wrapping up, I'm also totally here for that. Well, there's one thing I did want to, um, I don't know if this makes sense, but, you know, there, there are these kind of extraordinary, um, uh, the sort of, um, ways that you configure the body as a kind of a tool and you talk a lot about um sort of social machinery and then the body is a tool and um and i i somehow at one point you um you're also talking about kind of the body as a part of this larger um machine or tool which is kind of our our larger culture and somehow a, a number of those things brought me, perhaps because of some work I've been doing recently where I've been thinking a lot about the idea of, um, the idea of nationhood, mm -hmm. the idea of a country. And in a way, the, the idea of a border as kind of perhaps one of the most extreme expressions of binary insistence, mm -hmm. right? That that insisting on national border. Mm -hmm. And um, so in reading your book and in our chat the other day and in preparing for this, I ended up um, kind of pulling all these books off my shelf. I sort of made like a little world of legacy. Um, I love that reading list. <laughs> Because <laughs> I also it's something that you really do in your in your book, which is incredibly generous. You're you almost gather together like a it's a gathering or it's mm -hmm. like a bouquet of you you're you're pulling references from so many different kinds of writers and thinkers and makers uh, across genre, across generation, across um, from music to poetry. It's really beautiful. So I, I think one of the things your work also is, this manifesto is a kind of a bibliography mm -hmm. um, in a very beautiful way. And one of the voices I, I wanted to kind of, it seemed maybe could belong there along with all of, with Moten and Delaney and all of the artists is um, Anzaldúa. 
mm. and um, Gloria and Zaldua. And I had to dig out a box because I just came back from Texas and I was like, I gotta find that, I gotta find that, I gotta share this with Legacy. Um, so from her book, Borderlands, which was written in the 80s, mm. um, the U.S.-Mexican border es una herida abierta, where the third world grates against the first and bleeds. And before a scab forms, it hemorrhages again, the lifeblood of two worlds merging to form a third country, a border culture. Borders are set up to define places that are safe and unsafe, to distinguish us from them. A border is a dividing line, a narrow strip along a steep edge. A borderland is a vague and a borderland is a vague and undetermined place created by the un emotional residue of an unnatural boundary. It is in a constant state of transition. The prohibited and forbidden are its inhabitants. Los otros Los otros live here, the squint-eyed, the perverse, the queer, the troublesome, the mongrel, the mulatto, the half-breed, the half-dead. In short, those who cross over, pass over, or go through the confines of the normal. I mean, some of the language she uses is troubling, hmm. but I think there's something sort of important here in her in her theory of borderlands culture and this idea of actually living within the troubled space that is neither here nor there and the making of that space um, that is a kind of a third space or a liminal space like what you mm -hmm. referred to in Essex Hempel's work and thinking about um, ways that we can gather together and move forward productively Something about Anzaldúa's borderlands theory feels um, full of possibility for me. Actually. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I almost just got goosebumps because I just think um, this question of borderlands is so important. And as well, um, when people ask about, um, you know, the discussion about gender binary as it exists within English feminism, I think, that, you know, they're, they're um, you know, some folks have a very flat read on it, right? They're like, okay, we're talking um, purely about pronouns and that this is a, a navigation negotiation about a sort of de redefinition of pronouns. But it's actually for me that and then a million other things because, um, you know, the question of the gender binary and how we are able to define ourselves and what that looks like and ensuring that we can be um, expansive in that. Um, is a question of nations um, because these things are gendered. It's a question of institutions, right? Like the, the ways that it's a question of, of state and capital, like, um, and of power, because the ways that, um, you know, these things move actually often exist across a gender binary. Um, you know, the, the things that are, are kind of weaponized within that, the ways that we, um, you know, are seeing um, folks kind of being um, undercut, under supported, underserved, right, exists within the language of the kind of masculine versus the feminine um, and the strong versus the weak and how those things, you know, are kind of brought together, um, you know, in a perfect storm to do really terrible work, like yeah, really absolutely. harmful work. Um, and so I appreciate that, you know, space that you speak of, you know, and kind of through that text of, of what exists in between. Um, and actually it brings me to the question that's in the chat. Um, and I'm aware that we're kind of right at the tail end of time, but I think it is a perfect question maybe to, um, to conclude on because it's just, you know, it speaks to uh, lots of the different points that have been brought up today, but someone has written, um, and Brian has shared with me, uh, for Zoe and Legacy, in thinking about negative space and togetherness of language, the idea of marginalized space on the page of text as punctuation, what punctuation mark would you use to describe this time? Um, and I kind of love that because like, of course, this is also the punctuation that we can um, conclude, you know, and use to, to close out today. Um, Zoe, do you have any thought on it? <laughs> well, yeah. well yeah. You know, I mean, what, I don't know why, but what comes to mind is the semicolon. Cause I'm like, yeah, all of that is there. Yeah. What For does me. that lead to? And what, what can we make it lead to? Hmm. You know, I think, and this is, if I can use this as a moment to ask you a, a, a question I've been wanting to ask, which is, I think 
um, along with what you just talked about, about um, kind of gender binary and power mm -hmm. structure. Also, you know, in, in this whole conversation, race is such a central part of this conversation. And mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you about your thoughts or um, ideas about alliance and the possibility of alliance, um, mm -hmm. the possibility of crossing crossing those boundaries with each other in terms of race? Yeah, I mean, so I guess I'll answer that question and as well um, answer your question and the question about punctuation. For me, I think it would be an M dash. Um, and recently someone on Twitter, I can't remember who it was, I'm glad I can't remember, but they said something like the M dash is the, this like the, um, the like like limp lettuce of punctuation. <laughs> I was like, really upset about that. I was like, how dare you? <laughs> because I feel like the M dash is like the ultimate expression of a kind of poetic form, um, especially when we're thinking about um, poetic space and um, what it means to kind of rebuild worlds. And uh, it, 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 it's a geography, it's a site to travel to. And you see it, you know, obviously used in like some incredible writing, you know, from the, the sort of um, Essex Temples to um, Etheridge Knight, like um, Audre Lorde, you know, the, the M dash holds a very particular position. Um, mm -hmm. So I love that. Um, and then thinking, you know, about the question um, that you've brought up, Zoe, um, about what race does and where, um, you know, certain types of allyship might operate. It's, um, the text is intersectional. Glitch Feminism is an intersectional text. Um, you know, it speaks from a, a kind of position um, as expanded from a, a sort of politic that, you know, Kimberly Crenshaw originally theorized on, um, which is super important, um, you know, in terms of the contribution of black womanhood towards a, a wider discourse of intersectionality. Um, and, you know, for me, it's like, it's necessary. There's, there's really not a, a way to negotiate that. Um, and so this question of allyship and intersectionality is deeply meaningful to me. Um, I think that you know, we're existing in a moment where things are increasingly polarized and that they do exist often within these binaries um, that feel very simple. Um, and actually that the best service maybe that we can do is to not let them be so simple. I think that the mm -hmm. more complicated and at points more frustrating life maybe exists within reading within that nuance. Um, but yeah, I, I found that, you know, it, I found actually great solace um, in this period of time in realizing that there are um, so many blurry areas that are less fixed um, within a kind of polarized political position. And so um, that's the place that maybe I want to kind of continue to occupy and think through. Mm -hmm. But thank you so much, Zoe. Thank you, Legacy. This has been really great. I do. I feel like we could talk all day. But... I know. We'll have to do. We'll do part two. I'll, I'll send you some dog pics. <laughs> okay. Thank right. you, FBA, as well. Yeah, it's, we really appreciate it. We also have a, a bunch of uh, uh, questions in the chat that we'll, we won't be able to get to. So hopefully one day, especially some great questions coming from our own students. So hopefully maybe we can find... Uh, Absolutely. My, my email is on my website, so if anyone wants to email me some questions, I'm always happy to nerd out. <laughs> thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much, Brian. Thank you, Legacy. Have a good day. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye, everybody.